Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Lisa McNary, Dean of Alumni and Parent Relations. Thank you for joining us for our fourth virtual Red Talk. They seem to have really taken off and we are so excited to have Sister Martha Ann Kirk. Now, this is someone that really needs no introduction, but I'm going to do it. She's so fabulous. I believe everybody knows who she is. She is one of our very own Sisters of Charity of the Incarnate Word. She's a professor at the University of Incarnate Word as well, and has taught in both the religious studies and art departments. She feels so blessed to hold a doctorate in theology and the arts from the Graduate Theological Union in Berkeley, California, and degrees from both Fordham University and the University of New Mexico, and of course, Incarnate Word College. Um, she has had the opportunities to speak at many, many conferences, research, and travel in 32 countries, encountering God's large family. She passionately believes that we need to protect all the children and thus speaks of embracing creative nonviolence. She has led study and service tours to the Holy Land, Turkey, Peru, Mexico, and Ireland. Sister Martha Ann is particularly interested in teaching compassion and creativity. Gospel stories are full of these. She has ministered through drama, dance, and visual arts, which can open our eyes and our hearts. She has written and performed several dramas based on biblical women. In recognition of Sister Martha Ann's work, particularly that of building bridges between Jews, Christians, and Muslims, she has been recognized with various peacemaker awards from civic, Muslim, and Catholic groups. Now, before she goes on, I wanna do a little bit of housekeeping. I would ask you all to, we wanna give our full attention to Sister. <clears throat> so during the presentation, I would like you all to hide your video. We don't have the capability with ours. If you could please hide your video and mute your mics. And there will be ample, ample opportunity at the end of our presentation where we want everybody to come live again and show their videos and turn on their mics and ask questions. We also have a, in, in the chat section, if you have questions throughout the presentation, we invite you to ask your questions in the chat and we will be sharing those with Sister throughout the presentation. So without further ado, Sister Martha Ann, please take it away. Thank you. I am absolutely delighted to be here. And I was talking to the people in the alumni office yesterday, and I said, I think they are like good shepherds. They want to reach out to people all over the world and help everyone to feel connected, to feel a little bit better in this very challenging time in our world. So I see that we have a distinguished alumni originally from Pakistan. I see that we have people from so many countries, from justice and peace classes, from my religion classes. I absolutely love having this opportunity to be with you. So the title of the talk is Living Compassion. So if you showed up, I think it's because you want to live compassion more. And I'm really delighted. I'm really grateful that you want to live compassion. And I want to start with something a little bit fun. Who are you? Are you one of over 7,000 students who have been educating me at Incarnate Word College, University of the Incarnate Word since 1972? So I want you to type in the chat box if you are one of my farmer students. Well, maybe you didn't actually sit in my classroom, but you helped me, you did activities with me, you did the blessing of the animals for the feast of St. Francis with me. So type in the chat box if you've been connected with me over the years and thanks for showing up. But you know, in the grocery store, I also meet the people that I taught at St. Peter's School, Incarnate Word High School. So from 1968 on, type in the chat box 
if you are one of the wonderful friends that have helping helped me enjoy life. Okay, now people who are reading the chat box, getting any interesting answers there? Yes, um, sister, we do have, actually we have some of our alumni board members and we have the president of our alumni association. We have Martin Padron that had you. And then Michelle Martin, she was living in Dallas. She has a very fabulous, fascinating career and she's just moved back and she's on as well. Um, Sonia was uh, as a, a former alumni board member and she's on as well. Oh, Mimi, Mimi Beck had you in the 1996 and went on a Holy Land study tour. Let's, let's see. Oh yes, we have many more. Yeah, yeah. I, I can tell that some of you are being bashful, but that's okay. Yes. Now, I want to go on to the next questions that you see on the screen. Where are you now? What city, what state, what country are you in? Or maybe you want to put where you come from originally. As I mentioned, my friend from Pakistan, is on right now, a friend from New Zealand. But let's try to get a sense of how many states, how many countries we're in right now are we come from. Because I want us to think about the wealth of many cultures, the wealth of many religions, the gifts we bring each other in our diversity. So type, type, type in the chat box. We do have someone that graduated. Cheryl graduated from Incarnate Word High School back in the 60s and graduated from Incarnate Word College in 72. Mm. And then Michelle currently lives in um, Dallas, sorry, Michelle, and originally from San Antonio, went to Panama. Mm -hmm. And Martin and his family are from Mexico, first generation US citizen and college grad. And Cheryl's also been to Europe, Israel, Greece 23 times. Mm. Now, this is really, really fun. So, I'm going to keep going, but that doesn't stop you from typing in the chat box. So I want you to realize that in the first 20 years, the Incarnate Word Sisters came from about 20 different cultures, 20 different countries. So let's keep in mind that in the 1800s, about 10% of the population was dying of epidemics, dying of plagues. So I don't know how you feel, but I feel like this COVID-19 pandemic is so hard. I feel overwhelmed sometimes. And so I think that we need to go into our deep story we need to go into our deep history. And the Incarnate Word story was born in the pain of 10% of the population dying. The mayor of the city heard that there were Catholic sisters in Galveston who were helping and he was begging. He said, you know, if you are privileged, you can get a private doctor to come into your home. But in the city of San Antonio, there's not any kind of a public clinic or a public ho hospital to help everyone. We need to think of the ordinary people. We need to think of the disadvantaged people. It shouldn't be just the privileged people that get help in hard times. 
Does any of this sound familiar to you? We are in a hard time. Are only the privileged getting health care? What about our sisters and brothers? What about people all over the world? I think we need our deep story because I think we need encouragement in our current realities. Now, I want you to realize that young women came to San Antonio. And um, I had a grant from the Texas Commission for the Humanities. I read over 400 pages of the letters of the woman on the left. I read about 300 pages of letters that the people in France wrote back to her. And she said, I'm discouraged, I'm frightened. I don't know what to do. Everything is so new. And in France, they kept saying, now do your best, trust in God, try, um, gather people, take risk, um, invite more people. We don't have all the answers, but if we listen to each other, we can help each other. I'm going to suggest those are the skills that you and I need right now. We need to listen to each other. We need community. We need to go deeper in our faith. We need to grow in compassion. So you showed up today. You want to learn about living compassion. So these young women from France, they really had not had formal nurses training, but they just tried to do the best they could and the more they did, the more challenging it got because some patients died and there were orphan children who were running around the little bitty uh, Santa Rosa. And then people just started leaving orphan children. You know, just in the middle of the night, they would leave orphan children on the steps of the sisters. So in not too many years, there were huge numbers of orphan girls, orphan boys, and the sisters needed to build and needed to help. Okay, now this is a question for all of you. This has come to be my favorite picture in the pandemic. This is one of the pictures that I am showing most in the pandemic. So I want you to think of, what is Sister Martha Ann thinking of? Why on earth is this the top picture for the pandemic. Now think a minute. And look into the children, look into the faces of the children. Look at the children, they are children like this now. they are children all over the world. Maybe they are children in your lap right now. Maybe they are children, um, in the next room. This is my pandemic picture because I haven't been in my regular classroom. I've been teaching on Zoom and I can't tell you how many parents have their children in their lap as they are attending my University of the Incarnate Word class. And I want you to know that I have the great privilege I'm working with a team of people in San Antonio. We are working on compassion education. Uh, we tried to get a grant, we didn't get it. We tried to get another one, we didn't get it. We tried to get another one, we didn't get it. We tried to get another one, we didn't get it. But you know, I keep writing. We got this grant. Any of you are invited to join us for this workshop on August 11th because we're gonna do critical thinking, we're going to grow in compassion, and we're going to think about civic engagement as those women were helping the mayor and the city of San Antonio 150 years ago. How are you in Dallas? How are you all over the world trying to help your neighbors, trying to do the best you can within your home? I'm going to go fast. I hope you're doing okay. Um, 
for the 300th anniversary of the city in 2018, I got this wonderful invitation. Incarnate Word people have been part of the history of the city for half of its history. Work with us, tell us your story. Uh, have your students exhibit in the Institute of Texan Cultures. Let's have educational events. Let's have festivals. And you can't quite tell here, but what I want you to see is current students celebrating with dance on the lawn, uh, doing a dance from India and students on the lawn at Incarnate Word in 1918. Uh, sisters in a boat where the headwaters is, where the water would come up. Well, there we are with Native Americans at the headwaters today, being grateful for the water, the reason for the city. So, wow, you, you sitting there right now, you are a part of our great history. And I want the time that we're together to be a time when you think, what are my strengths? What are my gifts? What do I have to um, contribute to the world in this really, really hard time? Uh, what do you have to contribute to the world in this hard time. Maybe you're even in this picture. In 2009, I gave my students an assignment. I said, as a religion teacher, I have heard that a woman, Karen Armstrong, that great writer, she gave a TED talk and she said, Compassion could unite us. So great religious people from around the world have been having these discussions and they come up with a document called the Charter for Compassion and it's gonna be inaugurated online. So students, you have got to go find some of our Jewish friends, some of our Christian friends. You've got to find our Buddhist friends. You've got to find our Muslim friends. And we're going to gather in Marion Hall Ballroom. And we're going to talk about the importance of compassion in religion. And we're going to think about compassion in our lives. And on a big screen, we're going to watch the inauguration of the Charter for Compassion all over the world. And so Dr. Lopita Nath, my wonderful Hindu friend that I constantly work with to help refugees or to do a better job with our students, she's talking about compassion in Hinduism. So we launched the Charter for Compassion. And I want for you to listen really carefully, this is almost like a test. I'm going to say to you, how are you living phrases of the Charter for Compassion? The principle of compassion lies at the heart of all religious, ethical, and spiritual traditions. Calling us always to treat all others as we wish to be treated ourselves. Compassion impels us to work tirelessly to alleviate the suffering of our fellow creatures. To dethrone ourselves from the center of our world and put another there. To honor the inviolable sanctity of every single human being. Treating everybody without exception. With absolute justice, equity, and respect. It is also necessary in both public and private life to refrain consistently and empathically from inflicting pain. To act or speak violently out of spite, chauvinism, or self-interest. To impoverish, exploit, or deny basic rights to anybody. And to incite hatred by denigrating others, even our enemies. Is a denial of our common humanity. We acknowledge that we have failed to live compassionately. And that some have even increased the sum of human misery in the name of religion. We therefore call upon all men and women to restore compassion to the center of morality and religion. To return to the ancient principle that any interpretation of scripture that breeds violence, hatred, or disdain is illegitimate. To ensure that you are given accurate and respectful information about other traditions, religions, 
traditions and cultures. To encourage a positive appreciation of cultural and religious diversity. To cultivate an informed empathy with the suffering of all human beings. Even those regarded as enemies. We urgently need to make compassion a clear, luminous, and dynamic force in our polarized world. Rooted in a principled determination to transcend selfishness. Compassion can break down political, dogmatic, ideological, and religious boundaries. Born of our deep interdependence, compassion is essential for human relationships and to a fulfilled humanity. It is the path to enlightenment and indispensable in the creation of a just economy and a peaceful global community. Now, close your eyes, or if you have pen and paper there, maybe you want to write, but how are you living out compassion? How are you exemplifying some of the wisdom that they were just sharing in this? You can do a search for Charter for Compassion, or at the end of this, I have resources. But I'm going to show it a second time. Actually, I show it four times in a row in my class. I have students break up in small groups, discuss it. I have them make action plans. But we're going to watch it a second time today. And I invite you to think even more deeply how are you living this out? And lies at the heart of all religious, ethical, and spiritual traditions. Calling us always to treat all others as we wish to be treated ourselves. Compassion impels us to work tirelessly to alleviate the suffering of our fellow creatures. To dethrone ourselves from the center of our world and put another there. To honor the inviolable sanctity of every single human being. Treating everybody without exception. With absolute justice, equity, and respect. It is also necessary in both public and private life to refrain consistently and empathically from inflicting pain. To act or speak violently out of spite, chauvinism, or self-interest. To impoverish, exploit, or deny basic rights to anybody. And to incite hatred by denigrating others, even our enemies. Is a denial of our common humanity. We acknowledge that we have failed to live compassionately. And that some have even increased the sum of human misery in the name of religion. We therefore call upon all men and women to restore compassion to the center of morality and religion. To return to the ancient principle that any interpretation of scripture that breeds violence, hatred, or disdain is illegitimate. To ensure that youth are given accurate and respectful information about other traditions religions and cultures to encourage a positive appreciation of cultural and religious diversity to cultivate an informed empathy with the suffering of all human beings even those regarded as enemies we urgently need to make compassion a clear luminous and dynamic force in our polarized world rooted in a principled determination to transcend selfishness compassion can break down political dogmatic ideological and religious boundaries born of our deep interdependence Compassion is essential for human relationships and to a fulfilled humanity. It is the path to enlightenment and indispensable in the creation of a just economy and a peaceful global community. In your mind, hold that in your heart. So our students in 2009 had a gathering. We inaugurated it in the city of San Antonio. 
a wonderful friend of mine, Reverend Ann Helmke, who was in our graduate uh, program in Justice and Peace Studies, went on with a bunch of ragtag friends to start the Peace Center. And they got excited about this. So in 2013, they started inviting all sorts of groups saying, what do you want to do about compassion in your Hindu temple? What do you want to do about compassion in your mosque? What do you want to do about compassion in your school, in your church? What do you want to do? So they invited people to think about it. And I'm going to call your attention to this because this really isn't about me. This is about all of you. You are part of the Incarnate Word family. Every year they have what they call a peace laureate. So if we want to think about peace, I, we think about compassion. And if we think about compassion, who on earth in the city could get us thinking about compassion? Well, what about that family of people when 10% 10, 10 of the population was dying of plagues, uh, three young people came and they started compassionately responding to the need, the incarnate word sisters. So we were called the Peace Laureates in 2013. And I'll tell you, this is really hard. See, if I single you out in my class and I say you are a great writer, I give you a huge responsibility to do better writing. They singled me out and they said, you're the peace laureate who exemplifies compassion. And you know, ever since 2013, I've been thinking, God, this is hard. I better do more. I better do better. But I'm gonna challenge all of you. You are the people who are carrying compassion to the world. How hard it is, how long it takes to develop compassion muscles within my life. So please look within your daily life, look within your mind, look within your heart. Are you developing compassion muscles? You know, when you learn how to play a piano, you develop muscles. When you are running, you develop muscles. When you are doing push-ups, you develop muscles. So I have been getting certified in compassion integrity training. I have been teaching with a team of people from six different countries. We've been teaching compassion integrity training to over 150 educators in the city of San Antonio because we need better muscles than ever to be compassionate, to teach compassion. So right now, I am asking you, are you developing your compassion muscle? Are you developing awareness of what is going on? Are you staying grounded at this time? Are you being realistic or are you living in fantasy world, living in all of the escapist television you can watch? Are you growing in a sense of common humanity all over the world, people feel like I do. They love their grandmothers, or I will say for me, I love my great aunt. She died in the midst of this COVID pandemic. She died. They love their children. They want their families to get health care. And in this time, are we developing the compassion muscle of impartiality? We care about everyone. And then I'll tell you, this is really, really, really a hard one. Are we developing forgiveness? Am I forgiving myself? 
am I forgiving the people that I live with? Gosh, it can be hard to be cooped up in your house with the same people. We got to work on the, the forgiveness muscle every day. And finally, are you developing that compassion muscle of gratitude? Gratitude. Do you wake up every single morning and say, I am still alive? Do you wake up every day and say, the light comes after the darkness? Do you wake up and say, I'm a person who has clean water. One out of nine people in the world doesn't have clean water. I should be in awe as I start to drink water. I should be in awe as I get a shower. Wow. Then what do you do next when you wake up? I go down to the kitchen, I turn on the coffee pot, and I start to smell the coffee. Am I grateful for the people in Guatemala or the people in Honduras that pick the coffee beans so I can have a cup of coffee? Am I grateful for the people that pick the bananas for me to enjoy for breakfast? Do I ever think about the wheat farmers that sowed the wheat so I could have bread or cereal? So let's think for a moment. Or maybe you want to write, you came today, are you developing your compassion muscles? Are you developing awareness? common humanity, impartiality? Are you developing forgiveness? Are you developing gratitude? You can continue to quietly think, or maybe you want to put something in the chat box right now. Um, you know, maybe you want to type in, hmm, never thought about compassion muscle developing. Or maybe you want to type in, wow, um, I never thought about that. Or maybe you want to type in, sister, you are absolutely crazy. You know, chance to type in the chat box. Going on to the next slide, we were thinking about developing compassion personally. Now, I want to think about groups. I want to think about the people in the city of San Antonio, but maybe you want to think about the group in your school or the group in your synagogue. Maybe you want to think about the group in your neighborhood, in your Lions Club group. It, it takes a while for groups to build understanding. It takes a while for people to listen to each other. It takes a while for people to develop consensus. But I cannot tell you how excited I was when the City Council of San Antonio in the summer of 2017 adopted the Charter for Compassion and said, we are going to be a city based on compassion. We are going to work together. So you can go to the city website, you can go to the faith-based office, you can click on the city resolution 
from 2017. Compassion is the purpose, principle, and unifying value that guides and compels people of all backgrounds, perspectives, creeds, cultures to treat all human beings with justice, equity, and respect. And whereas research demonstrates that practicing compassion produces positive benefits in all sectors, so I'm not going to read you the whole resolution, but I want to tell you what my little group has been focusing on. Section two, the city encourages San Antonio's institutions of learning to have all ages explore and teach compassion based on the extensive on the understanding that extensive research and resources validate the full spectrum of the benefits of compassion from being good for the bottom line of business. If you are um, a CEO of a huge business, infuse compassion into your system. Your employees will be happier. They will help each other. They will come into work better. They will flourish. If you're being compassionate to them, they will grow in compassion. There are um, quantitative studies of businesses being better. There are quantitative and qualitative studies of schools being better. And so I want all of you to see the wonderful website that my friends and I have been developing over the years. And uh, the person with the blonde hair is uh, Reverend Ann Helmke, whom I referred to, whom I am constantly working with. So that Charter for Compassion Resolution is on the website of her office. Um, the faith-based office in the city. So we're in the city for good. We're here to help each other. We are one of 450 cities in the world that have said we're going to be a city of compassion. So we've got to give a good example. Other people, other schools, other cities are looking at us. So I told you, we kept writing grants, writing grants, writing grants. We didn't get them, but you don't give up. Don't give up. So this summer, we were going to have an institute with about a thousand educators in the Henry B. Gonzalez Convention Center learning compassion. So in their kindergarten or their graduate med school or their high school or with their special ed students, are at the University of the Incarnate Word, they would be better in their classroom. Well, the pandemic hit us, but we said, no, no, let's go forward in our purpose. So we had the online five week intensive training. I am inviting you to do the online compassionate integrity training. I loved teaching with people from six different countries. I loved having kindergarten teachers. I loved having middle school teachers. I loved working together on this. And so let's think about this. In the middle is our mayor, Ron Nuremberg. On his first day, he signed on with the city council to the Charter for Compassion. Maybe you recognize our provost next to him, the woman in our sister city of Monterey, Christina, who's spreading the Charter for Compassion there. Maybe you recognize uh, dear teachers who work with me, Sandy Guzman Foster, Sherry Herbers. Maybe you recognize some of our incarnate word. Oh, also Michael Van Doren, nursing professor, uh, Sister Mari Chewy, Sister Adriana. And we are all saying, let's take compassion. Let's live compassion. 
So how do we help create a world of good in the midst of a world of hurt? Where do I see the most hurt? Now, some of you have been sending in questions before we gathered today. Um, you know, you've been talking about people suffering from lack of health care, from poor education. You have been talking about people who are suffering because of a prejudice towards um, homosexuals, prejudice towards people of different faiths, people of different religions, prejudice towards elders, lack of understanding. So you came today because you want to live compassion more. You want to build compassion in our Incarnate Word family. So I've been talking all too much about how I try to build my compassion muscles. I've been asking you to build your compassion muscles. And I think that this pandemic might be our greatest opportunity. This might be the best time in our whole lives. This might be the best time in the whole world to build compassion because our pain, our pain is inviting us to go deeper. I'm going to turn to our Dean of Alumni and I could show more slides. I've got a whole lot of compassion and integrity training to teach you, but maybe this is the time we need to open up the discussion. Uh, Lisa McNary, my dear friend, our Dean of Alumni, do you think we should go into questions and discussion now? We certainly can do that. I did want to point out a few more messages in the chat box. Um, I think you know a good friend of yours, Sawat Hussein, who is also one of our alum of distinction. She was on for a while, but had to leave for a class, but she wanted to say thank you for, for speaking on compassion. And then we had Mimi who said that she finds practicing gratitude makes everything better. And then, Blanca said, sometimes life is so busy that it can be overlooked to take care of the compassion muscles. Thank you for opening my mind about that. And Mikkel says, practicing compassion helps us to help others, but it also helps us with doing self-maintenance during our times of struggle and mishap. What wisdom we have out there. What wonderful people we have out there. And we invite others. We know this is streaming live on Facebook. If you have any questions or comments for sister, please share those with us. And also you can um, continue to ask your questions in our chat. And I can go back to my slideshow. But, you know, you all come with gifts. You all come with wisdom. So this really is an open time for you to speak or for you to write. We did have another visitor that um, Anna has, she's, her and her husband are watching from Austin and she graduated in 1953 and heard a presentation from you when she came back to Incarnate Word for her 50th reunion. 
Mm. Are we welcome? Yeah. Do you want to continue with your presentation, sister? Yes. Okay. Uh, Thank you all. You can continue to send your questions and comments in the in the chat section. We're not going to see this film, but I'm giving you a link to an article that I wrote where then you can see how is Monterey, Mexico, and how is San Antonio, Texas, how are we growing in compassion? I want you to realize if you live in our city, you can use this but maybe in wherever you are, you could start this. This is an online resource. So if I am walking outside of our house and maybe um, I encounter a homeless person, I could put in the zip code, then I could click on housing and I could find some information. So we're developing this directory and it's pretty wonderful. And none of us can do everything. We don't have all of the resources, all of the gifts, but we can help each other. Now, a part of compassion is compassion for the earth. And I wanna invite you to think about this right now. How are you growing things these days? Are you taking care of your yard these days? And I want to especially encourage you to be part of the Compassion Tree Project. Trees are our friends. They make oxygen for us. Every time you plant a tree, you are gifting everyone around you with more oxygen. So in our city of San Antonio, we want to plant 20,000 trees for 2020 because our sister city, Monterey, challenged us to plant trees. And I am so grateful that our president, Dr. Evans, he got the Boy Scouts learning from me about the Compassion Tree Project. And he and his wife and his sons they're going to be planting another tree soon. So on the City Compassion Tree website, we can post it and we can encourage each other. So how about you? Why don't you do a tree planting and we will post that, that you are a friend of the earth and you're making more oxygen for your friends. Now, I'm gonna go a little bit into something directly from compassion integrity training classes that I had the wonderful opportunity to learn online. I worked with the teaching team to teach online and who knows, right after this, you might go to their website and you might sign up to start doing this for the next 10 weeks. Or you might say, hey, Sister Martha Ann, uh, you know, why don't we have our own Incarnate Word um, alumni, student, teacher, 10 week of compassion training going on. It's out there. It's helpful. It will make you feel better about yourself. It will build your muscles. So let's think about levels. So you can be on the first level. Um, I wish other people wouldn't be suffering in the world right now. You could go on to level two. Ooh, it's really urgent. I don't want people to be suffering. But you would stay at, I can't do anything. I'm helpless. I believe one of the most important things we can give our students, and I say this to fellow professors, is to give people a sense of, I can do something. I can light one candle in the darkness. I can call my lonely great aunt right after this and give her joy. I can make cookies for my family right now. I have the ability to do something. I can go online and I can sign petitions that people get more health care. I can be engaged. 
So I am encouraging you to learn about levels of compassion. And I am encouraging you to take personal responsibility. You are going to do whatever you can. There are more refugees than ever than, than the Second World War in the world today. All of us can go online and sign petitions to help refugees and immigrants. So I encourage you to study more because we need to understand systems. Compassion is a motivation. It doesn't tell us exactly what to do. We can have compassion for our family, but then we might not think of the other families or the other groups. So we need to go more deeply. We need two wings to fly. We need to learn about interdependence. We're part of vast systems. Um, we are dependent on other individuals, institutions, on the environment to survive and thrive. And where individual actions similarly affect others. So I told you I start my day with wonderful coffee. And I think, what about the people that picked my coffee? We are buying fair trade coffee. We don't want to exploit the people picking coffee. Um, so think about the systems you're in. Are you in educational systems? Are you in neighborhood systems? Are you in healthcare systems? Are you in uh, club systems? Who are you related to? How do we all relate to each other? We need each other. The public library, how wonderful. We need it. Then take systems perspectives to all you do. If I see a hungry person on the street, do I think, what is wrong with that person? Why don't they have a job? Or start to think of the pieces of the puzzle. Think of the pieces of the puzzle. Why might that person be homeless? I think we need to go out dancing. In my class, we dance in circles of compassion. Uh, on World Refugee Day, I am leading refugees in San Antonio and friends in dancing. We're going to finish this dancing, and you're going to go out dancing and sharing compassion in the world. Are you ready for it?
Sister, are you ready for some questions? Are you ready for some questions, sister? If there is time, I would love it. I would love it. But anybody that has to leave can. I'm a teacher that ends classes on time. So you can stay back because you're so interested, but you can leave also. I think there, there were a couple that were related to the coronavirus. Um, one of them, she is a mother and a teacher and she wants to know how to keep calm for her own babies and for her students. And that she says that she's a complete wreck over all of this. Thank you for being so honest. Thank you for bringing that up. I showed a slide about the compassion muscle and I had the word awareness. And you're, you're giving me a chance to talk about that. And this is so important. First of all, everyone be aware of your breath. Be aware of the air that you take in, the air that you breathe out, the air that you take in, the air that you breathe out. Whether we're talking about early Christian teachers or Buddhist teachers, focusing on breath has been one of the best ways to calm down. Focusing on breath has been one of the best ways to realize our interconnection. You know, maybe this same oxygen was breathed by Jesus. You know, maybe this same oxygen was um, breathed by St. Teresa of Avila. We're sharing the oxygen in the world. None of us is alone. So I want to suggest personally, and I want to suggest with small children, awareness. Breathe deeply. Be aware of your breath and um, focus, focus on what is right here. Focus on a pencil, focus on a glass of water. In compassionate integrity training, we learn to be aware, we learn to focus, on the here and now. We learn to recognize that we are a part of each other. We can help each other. We can encourage each other. You know, I, I go to morning prayer in our little chapel and there are only two, two Sister Jean and I in the convent right now, but we can turn on music, on beautiful music on our laptops. Other people are creating beautiful music to help us. We can turn on guided meditations to help us reflect, help us calm down. I really appreciate that very, very good question. I'm going to invite you to compassionate integrity training online, but I want to invite you to realize, wow, you've got the wisdom within yourself. Go deep, go deep. Thank you. And thank you, Sister Martha Ann. I believe you answered the rest of the questions within your presentation. I know everybody appreciates the time that you have shared with us. And we are all going to live our lives with more compassion. So thank you to everybody else for joining us.